All right, are we ready? Okay. Um, okay, so Andrea said, I'm also a certified um, professional resume writer. I have been one for um, 15 years. And uh, prior to that, I was um, a hiring manager and uh, for a large retail company and um, a trainer and a recruiter. So uh, I had, I've had quite a bit of experience in this um, field sort of sitting on both sides of that desk. Um, so just so you know, this is, um, these are two classes, generally resume writing and interviewing skills that I used to teach um, in an all day format. Um, each, each one got a day. So um, I've had to condense pretty significantly, um, but hopefully you'll get the basics from this. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen because I've done this all in a, a PowerPoint to make it um, easy to see. So let's, okay. Can everybody see my screen? Yeah. Somebody? Yeah, okay, good. Okay, all right, so um, we will start off um, just by explaining a little bit about resume writing. Um, so there is no one right way to do it. You could have, you should give your resume information to three different writers and you will get back three very different perfectly good resumes. Um, there's no one right way, but there are a few wrong ways to do it. So we're hopefully gonna eliminate uh, some of those here. Um, resume writing is peculiar. It's not like any other writing, because you write in fragments and not complete sentences. Um, and the goal really is to say as much as possible using as few words as possible. Um, that's really important that you learn how to be concise when you are doing this. Resumes should not be static documents, which means that um, you're not going to just write one resume and then just sort of hand it out willy-nilly. Um, you ideally will change your resume to suit the positions that you are applying for. Um, a lot of people have more than one resume. Uh, when I was looking for this job, um, I had four different resumes because I had skill sets in several areas and in several industries. So I wrote a resume for each of those skill sets or industries, and then I tweaked each one um, as I sent them out so that they suited the positions I was applying for. Um, so that's not uncommon at all. There are lots of resume templates available. Some of them are quite good, um, but a lot of them are not, and they don't allow for customization, um, and they can wind up making your resume look unprofessional. But if you find one that you like, by all means, um, use it. They can be helpful. Um, and it's important to understand what the resume really is for. It is simply to get you an interview. It's to get your foot in the door. It will not get you a job, but it can prevent you from getting a job. And I'll give you just a little story. Um, years ago, I was hiring uh, managers for the retail stores in rural South Carolina. And it was kind of tough. Um, I'd had a hard time. I had gotten in a bunch of resumes and had been going through them. And a lot of them were, were bad, so I was having to sort of make concessions. Um, but one of them stood out as the worst I have probably ever seen. Um, it was seven pages long. It was full of errors. I want to say there were 40 or 50 mistakes, the spelling mistakes, grammatical, spacing, all kinds of errors. And it was, it was printed on this decorative paper, like... Um, it looked like an aquarium scene, so it was water and, and there were fish sort of swimming past. Um, it was the most bizarre resume I'd ever gotten. And normally I would have just put that aside on what we call the TBNT file, the thanks but no thanks. But for whatever reason, I, I decided to try to help this person. And I sent them a note back. I, I marked all the mistakes on the resume and I sent them a note back and said, I can't consider your resume. I really think that you should, um, you know, seek some professional assistance um, or, or at least ask someone else for help in doing this. Um, and I, I sent it off and I didn't think any more about it. And I hired someone for the position. They didn't work out. I had to go back to the drawing board, got all new resumes in, wound up hiring a woman who was really wonderful and wound up staying with the company for a number of years. Um, and after I offered her the position and she accepted it, she said, um, that she wanted to thank me because I had sent her resume back to her. And I said, oh my goodness, are you the fish lady? Because <laughs> that's the only 
resume I ever sent back. And she said yes. And she said she thought that she was going to gain attention with you know, printing it on that paper. And I said that she had, but it was the wrong sort of attention. So that's a really good example of a resume that can lose you a job without you know, you even getting your foot in the door. But her second resume got her the interview and then she wound up getting the job. So, um, so first impressions are really important. And you really only have a few seconds to make an impression on the reader. Um, so you have to write clearly, you have to write concisely, and you have to make sure that that reader can zero in on the information they need right away. Okay, so before you start, whether you're writing your resume or someone else is doing it for you, you've got to gather up a whole lot of information um, and provide it. Of course, your name, address, phone number, email address, your job titles, dates of employment, uh, company names and locations, your job descriptions, which are incredibly important, uh, education and training dates and locations, and volunteer information. Um, there are things that you will not include on your resume, and I know this seems weird to some people, but you would be amazed at the things people try to put on. Your birth date, social security number, marital status, children, hobbies, a photo. Um, I have gotten all of those in resumes. and. Um, you have to remember that there are questions that interviewers are not allowed by law to answer and they generally relate to those things your age your marital status the number of children you have things like that so you want to um, make sure that you don't provide that information um, on your resume something important is your email address if you have one that does not sound professional um, and you would be amazed at some of the uh, email addresses that i've seen some of them actually quite um, offensive. Um, if you have a, an email address that is not professional, you want to get one. And it just should have your name, basically, and you might have to have a number or something on there as well. But make sure it's, it's professional. Um, again, that first impression is important. And something that's very important is you're going to make a list of the skills and experience that's necessary for the jobs that you want. Um, this is important for a couple of reasons. First, so that you can focus your resume, but also the ads for the jobs that you're applying for will provide you with the keywords that you want to sprinkle um, in your resume pretty liberally. Um, because a lot of companies now are using um, electronic readers to review resumes, and they are just going to ping on those words, those keywords, and human readers, of course, will see them as well. And the more keywords you have that relate to the job description or the ad, uh, the, the, the higher up you're going to be in the, the line for an interview. And then you have to decide what sort of resume you need. And there are a few different kinds. We're going to talk about the two really most basic, um, one that's experience-based uh, or one that is skills-based. And I'll show you examples of both, but before we do that, I want to give just some general guidelines for resume writing. Um, when possible, you want to keep your resume to one page if you have fewer than 10 years of experience, two pages if you have 10 or more years. Um, if you've got two pages, you want to try to fill it up. If you've only got a couple of lines on the second page, then you definitely want um, to condense something in your first page. If you've got more than two pages and you're not a college professor or an attorney that has to detail cases, things like that, then you probably can edit and get that down to two pages. The reader doesn't have a lot of time. They don't want to plow through two or three pages, three or four pages of information. So you, again, you say as much as possible with as few words as possible. If you do have two pages, you want to include a footer that says uh, page one of two on the first page and then page two of two with your uh, contact information on the second. And the reason for that is even though um, resumes don't always get um, printed, if they do, you don't want them to get separated, the pages to get separated. Um, you wanna make sure that the reader understands fully that this resume is not complete and they can look for that second page. Um, if you are sending your resume in the mail, do not staple two pages together. Um, sometimes they're run through uh, scanners and things like that, and you don't want the, the person who's reading it to have to take the time to take that staple out. Um, generally, it's only necessary to include 10 to 15 years of work history. It's not a hard and fast rule. You can. There are lots of reasons why you might go back further, um, but generally what you've done in the last decade or so is going to be the most important to uh, 
the prospective employer. You don't need to include the months uh, in your dates for your work history, just the years are fine. You wanna use bullet points instead of writing in paragraph format. Um, bullets will draw the eye and it helps the reader to focus on the um, important information without having to weed through a paragraph. You're never going to use the words I or me in your resume. It's implied that it's about you. And again, you're not writing in sentences. You're not writing in conversational style. You're writing in fragments. You want to leave that out. You want to usually put your education after work history unless you have just received your degree within the last year or two, and you have very little work history to support it. Uh, if you're changing careers and your degree um, works for the new career, but doesn't support your previous experience, then you wanna go ahead and put it at the top as well. But ideally, while your education is important, your experience is generally more important. Um, if you've been out of school more than three years, your GPA is not relevant and nobody cares. All they care about is what you've been doing uh, since you graduated. So leave it off. You want to write in a standard form, uh, for, font, rather, uh, Times New Roman, 11 usually, Arial 10, or the word default is generally fine, but don't get into any sort of fancy fonts. The phrase references available upon request. Um, don't use it. It's just filler and fluff. Everybody knows that if they ask you for references, you're going to give them. So it's just silly to put it on there. It takes up space. Um, and you're going to use the least amount of formatting possible. Um, and, you, and that's so that your resume will travel well when you send it via email. I like to save copies as PDFs if I'm sending a hard copy. Um, but you also want to keep an unformatted copy of your resume so that you can copy and paste it into an electronic application when necessary. If you've ever tried to fill out an electronic application and, um, and copy and paste your formatted resume, you see what it looks like. It, it, it does not travel well. So you want to keep an unformatted copy as well. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the two different types of resumes. Um, Experience-based is the first. It's the most common. It's the one you probably think of um, when you're thinking about writing a resume. They're used generally when you are looking for a job that's in the field that you've been in for a while or where all your experience is relevant. Your jobs are listed in reverse chronological order with the one you have now or the one you just recently had first. Um, and though you're probably going to include a list of skills, your work experience is really the focus of this type of resume. Okay, so some possible sections. And again, remember, this is not um, an exact science. You may decide to format differently or, or keep your, you know, put your, um, your sections in a different order, and that's fine. Um, but you're going to have, of course, in ev on every resume, you're going to have your header with your name, address, phone, and email. Um, a profile statement. I like to use these because you, they help to focus the resume. You can use... Um, a number of keywords in there. You can also um, use the title of the position you're looking for um, to sort of make the connection between you and the job in the reader's mind. Um, and I'll show you that on um, a copy of or a, an example of the resume. You're going to have a skills list, your professional history. You'll have a footer if it's two pages to show that this is page one of two. And on page two, you might have your education and training volunteer experience and your footer that shows this is page two of two. And it should have your contact information as well. I'm gonna show you an example of a two page um, experience-based resume, just so you can get an idea. Now this is someone who has significant work history. Um, so you can see the, uh, the header, the profile, uh, statement which shows workforce development management professional. So they didn't use the specific title of the job, but they use the industry titles. Um, so they make that connection. Uh, professional skills, and they're uh, organized pretty neatly. Um, you have professional history, your footer, your education, volunteer, and your footer at the bottom. And I break this down for you by page in the next. Thing. Okay, so when you're looking at the first page, um, the things that stand out is that there's good use of white space here, and white space is exactly what it sounds like. It's the, the white space between the type. Um, and you can see that it, you know, each section is, um, is clear. 
um, each job is clear. There's a break between them. Um, it looks pleasing. The margins are not too narrow or too wide. This it is not a standard margin. You can change those. That's a good way to be able to get extra words onto um, one page to expand your margins. Um, something that's important to note is the tense um, in the job descriptions. When you have a present position, one that you are currently working, all of your action words in your um, job description should be current, uh, present tense. So here we have teach, provide, maintain, work, and participate. Those are all present tense words. In the, um, the previous positions, they should all be past tense. So we have administered, connected, handled, referred. Everything is in past tense, okay? And that's important. Um, to, to let the reader know, you know, it's helpful to let them know what you're doing now and what you were doing. You will note that the job descriptions are written in fragments and separated by semicolons. There are no periods used at all in the entire document, and that is because there are no complete sentences. Um, you do not want periods at the end of fragments because it's just grammatically incorrect. Um, formatting is consistent. You can see there's the same amount of space between each job, between each section. Consistency is important. You don't want to have um, your bullet points uh, tabbed over five spaces here and ten spaces here. You want it to look uniform. And the footer clearly shows that there is another page. So on the second page, you have training and education. Um, they're listed logically. You notice there's no dates. You don't have to put dates there at all unless you just got your degree and want that, you know, to be known. Um, otherwise, it's really not that important. Um, volunteer information. The reason that this is included is because it is relevant to the job. Um, and even if a volunteer position isn't relevant, you can still list it because it does show community engagement. Um, it shows initiative, um, sort of extracurricular things. So it's not a bad idea to include, even if, um, even if it's not relevant to the position. And then the footer clearly shows that this is the second page and it has the contact information. So if this page gets separated, um, the reader can say, oh, well, I need to find Mary Jones's first page, okay? All right, so that's experience-based. Skills-based resumes are a little less common than experience-based. Um, they're used, say, when you are changing careers or your relevant experience is recent. Um, they focus more on what you can do rather than what you have done. And the work history becomes secondary to the skill sets. Um, so you're looking at, really, in this resume, you're looking at transferable skills. Um, as such, your job descriptions might be listed out of chronological order, and you're always gonna have a list of skills um, and accomplishments. Now, what I did here was I took Mary Jones's resume, her two-page resume, which is experience-based, and I turned it into a skills-based resume. So Mary Jones has workforce development and management experience. She wants to get a job um, as an aquatics director at um, a pool in a parks department. So you will notice that she has swim experience over here. So what we did, what I did, was take her resume and geared it to um, another type of position, one she has never held. Um, so it's important to note that it's all on one page now as opposed to two pages because she simply doesn't have the work experience to support two pages any longer. Um, I didn't put the title of the resume or the title of the position rather here because she has never been an aquatics director. So, you know, calling herself one really um, doesn't work. But any type of director position requires management experience. So um, management professional would suffice. Um, in her, her um, profile statement, I made some changes to include some of her swim experience and the fact that she's familiar with pool management. Her skills list changed, relevant management experience to the left, relevant swim experience to the right. And then her relevant professional experience section um, 
took the place of her professional history section. So we put in operations management experience because that is going to be very important and then her swim coaching uh, and instruction experience. Um, and then after that, I put additional professional experience just to show that she has had, um, she has been working even though she hasn't been working in this particular field and she has a solid work history. Um, so what this shows is that even though she has not been an aquatics director, she does have the skills to do that job and those skills came from other types of work. So that's what makes it a skills-based resume, okay? All right, um, and we can do questions at the end or you can put them in the chat if you want. All right, so most important tip when writing anything really is that you should proofread everything. And um, you'll notice I didn't proofread my header here. Um, so my mistake is that I spelled read wrong. Um, and it's very easy when you are writing something to read it several times and see it as you think it should be, not as it is. It's you sort of become blind to it um, after you've read it a few times. So you want to always have someone else proofread something that you're going to be sending out to um, someone, uh, you know, to a prospective employer, because I will tell you that there's nothing worse than um, sending it, either hitting the send button or putting it in the mail and then finding out afterwards that you have a typo. Very frustrating. So proofread everything and then do it again and then do it again. Okay, so there are some weird things that um, sometimes people have to handle in resumes. And the thing is, is that you can try to cover something up. Um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I would never, ever, ever advocate lying on a resume. You never want to say that you've done something you didn't or, you know, indicate that you worked at a place longer than you did. Never lie. You can leave things out. You can sort of rearrange things, um, but, but never lie. That's important. Um, so say you have a gap in your work history. Um, one of the ways that you can minimize that is to include and elaborate on volunteer experience if you, that you gained during the gap. Um, if you didn't, say you, you became ill and you couldn't work, um, you can explain that in a cover letter if you didn't do anything during that period. Um, you can also minimize it by using a skills-based resume as opposed to an experience-based resume. Now say you have the opposite problem and you have had too many jobs in a pretty short period of time so it makes you look like a job jumper um, because that is a red flag to employers they don't want to see someone who has gone you know from a job from six months to a month here and three months and or, or even a year each time because they generally employers want you to be there for a while if they're going to invest in training dollars in you so um what you can do to sort of minimize that look is to list only the jobs that you had for a long, a longer period of time, eliminate the very short period. So if you worked six months, one month, six months, one month, go ahead and leave those one months out and leave the six months in. It's still not ideal, um, but it's, it's doable. Um, I had a job for a year that I absolutely hated. It was a terrible job. Um, I didn't like the company. I didn't feel like I learned anything. It didn't advance my career, but it was at a time when the job market was in really bad shape and I was really struggling to find something. Um, now, during that period, I also had a second job that I'd had for quite a long time and, and had for quite a long time after. It was part-time. Um, so when I did my resume, after that, I didn't want to include that job that I had for the year, the one I didn't like, because I just didn't feel like it was, it looked good. Um, so I left it off and I filled up that space with that part-time job. Um, so if you can do that, that works out. You, you can eliminate things. You don't have to put everything on your resume. That's, that's acceptable. And again, you can use a skill-based resume if that doesn't work. If you have a disability, um, figuring out when to disclose it uh, can be difficult. And in some cases, it's, it's kind of a personal decision. But generally, um, what you should know is under the ADA, if a company has more than 15 employees, they are required to provide reasonable accommodations to a person who discloses a disability. 
And the law defines disability as a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. Um, now, generally, there's not an obligation to disclose any sort of disability-related information until after the job is offered or started. And only when the need for a reasonable accommodation becomes apparent. If that need never arises, then um, you don't have to mention the disability. You're not required to do that. But if you need a reasonable accommodation, even to go through the hiring process, um, then you may need, like a communication device or something like that, then that's something that you might need to disclose when the interview is scheduled. Um, when you go to the interview, if you have a visible disability, you haven't said anything about it as yet, um, but, but it's clear that you have a disability and the person interviewing you is gonna see it, many people feel that um, the best thing to do is to explain it to the employer um, and let them know how it will or will not impact your ability to do the job, okay? All right, now along with um, resumes. You have cover letters. Uh, there are two schools of thought where cover letters are concerned. One is that you never need one. One is that you always need one. Um, I fall into the latter category. I believe that they are necessary even if they are not read. You want to err on the side of caution and be better safe than sorry. So I think they're important. I think they're necessary. Um, I also think they should be relatively short and to the point you only want a few paragraphs. I've had three page cover letters, and I will not plow through those. Um, this is a good place to explain something uh, that needs explaining on your resume, like a gap in your work history, or the reason for a career change when it's, when it's not obvious on the resume. Um, you definitely want to explain it. You don't want to repeat everything that's on your resume. There's, I've had those letters as well. Um, that's just redundant. You want to tell the employer something new about yourself, something that's not on the resume, and that will show what you're going to bring to the, the table, to their company that, that's um, different from what someone else might. Um, if you don't want your current employer to know you're seeking another position, you can let the prospective employer know in the cover letter that this should be confidential. Um, if you're worried about this and you, you um, are worried that the, that the letter will not be written, you can add the words confidential resume to the top of your resume. And in the um, uh, or in the um, the um, subject line of an email if you're sending it that way, okay? You always wanna thank the person in advance for their consideration of your resume. And again, you wanna proofread everything and have someone else do it for you. You do not want those mistakes. The other thing that you have to have uh, with a resume is a list of references. Um, it's likely that you will be asked for them. You want to have at least three, no more than five, and you want to have people who have known you in a professional setting, um, ideally supervisors, but co coworkers work as well. Um, you don't want your best friends. That's, you know, obviously they're not going to say bad. Well, no one's going to say bad things about you. You choose people, obviously, who are going to say good things about you. But the person reviewing wants to hear from people that you've worked with. Teachers are also um, good if you're especially if you're a student you just come out of school <coughs> excuse me <coughs> okay um you want to be sure to ask your references it's okay to use them um, in advance because you're going to be giving out some of their personal information so they need to be aware and they also need to know that you're expecting them to say nice things um, you should always take the list with you to the interview. Some people send them with the resumes, which I, and I have done that. I don't think that's a problem, but it's possible that your references will be checked before you actually sit the interview, just so you know. So on the reference sheet, you are going to include, again, three to five people. You're going to have their name, phone number, email address, how you know them, and how long you've known them. Generally, the information that employers want. Okay. Okay. So you have submitted your resume and cover letter. Um, you are waiting to hear back from the prospective employer about an interview. Um, 
Make sure that you are checking your email regularly. Some companies communicate via email exclusively. Um, you also want to check your spam and junk folders just in case. Um, a lot of times things wind up in those folders. Um, you also want to make sure your voicemail is, your message is professional. And also that anyone who might answer your phone um, or you know, if you have a landline that your family uses, um, make sure that whoever is answering knows that you're expecting a call from an employer so that they answer the phone professionally as well. When the call comes, you wanna smile when you speak to the caller. He might not be able to see you, but he will hear the smile. I know that sounds strange, but it's true. Um, when you get the call, try to be as flexible with your schedule as you can. You don't wanna say, oh, no, nope, that didn't work for me. No, sorry, can't come then. Nope, can't come then either. Um, you wanna, if you have to move things around, and if you want this job and you wanna move things around, um, that would be the best thing. If you've got a choice, be either first or last. Um, you're memorable and um, you set the bar high or you raise it at the end. You want to confirm, this is so important, confirm the address, the time, and the name of the person you'll be speaking with and get a phone number uh, in case you have an emergency or you're going to be late, but you're not going to be late. Um, that's really important so you know exactly where you're going and, and who you need to talk to. You want to thank the caller and make sure you have a professional interviewing outfit clean, pressed, and ready to go. I cannot stress the importance of this. If you figure you're gonna go shopping and get something in the interviews tomorrow, you'll be scrambling and panicking. So make sure you've got something you can wear to an interview that is professional and that it is clean and pressed and ready when you need it. So the day before the interview, again, make sure your clothes are clean and pressed. Um, review the time and address. You don't know where you're going. You probably want to um, not necessarily trust your GPS and just make a trial run. I have <laughs> always done this. I think every interview I have ever been to, I have made sure I knew where I was going in advance and how long it was gonna take me to get there. I would rather sit in a parking lot an hour early than be one minute late. If you don't know very much about the company, you wanna look them up and learn about them. And you're gonna write down a list of questions that you can ask the interviewer. Um, you wanna avoid questions about salary and benefits in the first interview especially. Um, you wanna ask about things like specifics about the position, um, about the company culture and their mission, and things like that. Just show that you are interested in the company itself um, and the position itself and not about what you need from it, okay? Um, give some thought to those age old interview questions. Um, you know, why should I hire you over somebody else? What are your strengths and weaknesses? That's a question most people hate, um, but a lot of interviewers ask it. Um, and the way that you wanna look at this is strengths generally not difficult. Most people can come up with um, at least one or two. And if you can't, you should, because why would an employer hire you if you don't think you have any strengths? Um, weaknesses though, that gives people, um, Pause. But the way that you answer that question is you come up with a weakness, but then you explain how you combat that weakness. So you're showing that it is one, but it isn't one. So say, say your weakness is um, you're, you're, you have poor time management. And you can say that, well, my, you know, in the past, I, I, have, I have had some time management issues. You know, I get caught up in a project and then I lose track and I don't get something else done that I'm supposed to. So the way that I have basically fix that is that I use um, my electronic calendar, I use um, notifications, I use a to-do list, um, I, you know, I've set off blocks of time for certain things. So, so just show ways that you, you have recognized the fact that this is a weakness, but you are fixing it, you have fixed it. Um, and that's how you answer that question. Don't ever say, I don't have any weaknesses, <laughs> because trust me, you do. Um, and, and the employer knows you do as well. And you also wanna print out several copies of your resume and your reference sheet uh, to take with you to the interview. On the day of the interview, you wanna give yourself plenty of time, shower, dress, and get there on time. Um, make sure you bring your resume and reference sheet. Um, sometimes you're gonna have more than one person interview you, and in case they are not prepared, and believe it or not, uh, interviewers are not always prepared. If you have an extra copy of your resume, you can just hand it over and then you appear prepared when they're not. Um, 
you want to get there 10 to 15 minutes early, not earlier than that. Do not arrive right on time because there's a, a, a good chance that you'll have to fill out an application or something like that, but 10 to 15 minutes early. If you are going to be late, don't be late, but if you're going to be late, call and let them know. Apologize. That's hugely important. If you're caught in traffic, explain because that's clearly not your fault, um, but just, you know, ideally don't be late. You want to be very, very nice to the receptionist. Um, receptionists are the gatekeepers. Um, I used to work at a company when I hired people and our receptionist sat, she was the only person who sat up front. Everyone else was back in the building. And so she would have a chance to observe people who would come in. And as soon as they left the interview, I would ask her what she thought. And she was, I trusted her judgment. She was very honest and if somebody, was not polite if they were on their phone and not saying you know nice things or whatever she would tell me and it would have a bearing on whether or not that person was hired um, so be very very nice to the receptionist um, leave your phone in the car at the very least turn it off completely um, never ever allow your phone to make a sound or to buzz or anything um, when you are in an interview it is it's disrespectful to the person uh, interviewing you. It just shows that you have some different priorities maybe than they would like you to have. Um, surely, if you can't be without your phone for the half hour or the hour that the interview is going to take, um, then you might have some bigger <laughs> problems than not having a job. Um, I had someone once in an interview actually pause it to answer the phone. Um, and he told me when he finished that it was about a job. And I just said, well, I hope you got that one um, because I'm not going to give you this one. <laughs> and I ended the interview and um, he, he actually looked surprised. But, um, but anyway, um, leave your phone in the car, okay? All right, at the interview, um, you want to, Stand, smile, make eye contact, shake hands firmly, not the little, you know, uh, dead fish sort of handshake. Sit where they tell you to sit, sit up straight, don't fidget. I know these things sound really um, elementary, but uh, again, having interviewed hundreds of people, I can tell you that not everybody understands these things. Um, that question, tell me about yourself. Um, you want to stick to a statement about your professional life. Um, the interviewer doesn't care that you, you know, go fishing every Sunday in your pajamas. Um, stick to your professional life. Um, you want to be concise with your answers. You want to answer the question at hand. You don't want to go off onto tangents if you can avoid it. If you're nervous, you can let the person know that you're a little nervous. That's okay. If you don't know how to answer a question, that's okay too. Just say so. Um, it is far better to be honest than to wing it and do a bad job. Um, remember, this is really important. Although the interview is about you, it is not about what you want. It's to show the employer that you are what they want. So, you know, your needs at this point are not the most important thing. Uh, it's certainly not to the employer. They may be to you, but not to the employer. So in that vein, in the first interview, you do not want to ask about salary or benefits. If the employer may bring them up, that does happen fairly often. Um, and if it does, you, you want to try to remain a little vague, like, you know, I don't want to give a salary range until I know a little more about the position, or I'm aware of that salary range and I can work with it, something like that. Um, ask when a decision is expected to be made. And when the interview's over, shake the interview's hand and get his card or her card. Um, that's important for the next step. Um, and you're also going to provide them with your reference sheet if they haven't already asked for it. Thank them and let them know that you are looking forward to hearing from them. After the interview, you're going to send a thank you note. And that's part of the reason that you get the card. Um, you want to send a note to everybody who was who interviewed you. You can do individual notes, or if you're not sure who everybody is, you can do just a, you know, to the person who interviewed you and team or something like that. Um, you can do it via email. That is quite acceptable now. Um, handwritten notes are still nice. Um, regardless, you want to make sure they're error-free. 
um, you appreciated their time, um, you'll, you're sure that you will um, you know, be a good addition to their company. If you've not heard from the company by the expected decision date, follow up. Um, you wanna follow up by phone or email whenever possible. Um, be friendly, be courteous, really, really important. And accept that very often, this is probably the biggest complaint that I have ever heard when I was in that field, is that companies do not work on your timeline. They may tell you it's gonna take them a week, it might take them three. Um, that's not uncommon these days. But you can continue to follow up, um, but I would say no more than once a week. Um, and always be friendly, never sound irritated, even if you are irritated. Um, and it's easy to get that way when you know, you're waiting and, and hoping for something uh, that isn't coming through. Okay, so um, in conclusion, <laughs> um, it, job searching is tough. It can be frustrating. Um, it can be incredibly intimidating. It, it can make you feel lost. Um, there's a whole lot to resume writing and interviewing, uh, and it's, it was obviously couldn't be contained um, in this short presentation. Um, certainly, you can seek out assistance. Um, if you have a disability, you can contact um, your local DARS representative. Um, they can help you. Uh, we can help you. There are other, um, you know, you have family members. Um, enlist other people's help um, to make it a little less intimidating. And the best advice I can offer is to be patient, always be professional, ask for help if you're out of your depth, follow up and proofread absolutely everything. Okay, and that is the end. So does anybody have any questions? If you guys have questions and you don't want to say them out loud, you can feel free to put them in the chat and I will post them or let Diane know. Can you email out the PowerPoint? Um, I, yeah, I guess so. Can I, Andrea? Is that all right? Yeah, as long as that's fine with you. Yeah, fine with me. Well, it's not looking like we have any questions, Diane. So mm -hmm. let me thank you very much for your presentation. You gave us all a lot of good tips and good things to think about, which hopefully none of you that are on there will be using anytime <laughs> soon other than Emma and Taylor. Um, but thank you guys for joining and feel free to drop in on Thursday as well. I'm working from home today, so I don't have my list, but I believe it's Alana on Thursday. Is that correct, Alana? That is correct. What are you talking about on Thursday? Budgeting. Budgeting. All right. Something we might all also be able to use. All right. I will see you guys later and I hope you have a great day. Thanks, Diane. Thank you.